We're in the TechCrunch studio today with Dan Premack, Senior Editor at Fortune and the creator of Term Sheet Email. Yep. Dan, welcome to the studio. Thanks for having me. So this is going to be fun. You clearly have a large knowledge base about what's going on in private equity and venture capital. Coming and visit us in San Francisco, tell us what's the thing that you're focused on most in, in the VC market right now. The VC market, I mean, I think the big thing right now is possibly the shift kind of from a focus on consumer to a shift on enterprise slash infrastructure. And, and that's kind of a, a big thing. And it's not to say that there's not tons of money still going to be going into consumer internet and to social. There, there is and there should be. But I think in terms of what venture capitalists see as their kind of short-term uh, returns, perhaps, they're focusing more on the enterprise side. And, and maybe we should have sensed this a couple of years ago when LinkedIn went public, even though a lot of people saw that kind of as a consumer company, even though obviously it wasn't. But, and I think that shift is interesting. Venture capitalists talk a lot about being long-term investors, but they're also a little bit like sheep. And when something is unsuccessful or perceived as unsuccessful, like you've seen you know, with, with Groupon and Zynga IPOs and Facebook to a lesser extent, and then you see things like Workday and Splunk seem more successful, I, I think there is that shift. So let's talk a little bit about that sort of time from LinkedIn to Facebook IPO, because yeah. LinkedIn IPO, I think people were shocked by the sort of P, you know, PE ratios, and now the company, the market cap now is actually quite healthy, yeah. right? And it's actually a sizable fraction. Yes. Trading, of trading much better on PE ratios than the average tech company. I mean, actually right. exponentially better than the average tech company. Right. And in, in terms of enterprise value is a sizable percentage of what Facebook's book value is now. Yeah. So how, how did it come to pass that private markets, right, let's say on secondary markets or what people were doing in valuations for Facebook, how, I mean, walk us through briefly, like how the drop was so precipitous. I, I think a few things. First, you know, on the LinkedIn IPO, for what it's worth, the day that that happened, the day LinkedIn went public, I was actually at an annual meeting of a large venture capital firm for a story I was writing for the magazine. And I can tell you that despite all the stuff that was being said on stage, everybody just kept checking their phones or their devices over and over and kept being stunned by how, how the price was going up. I think there was, a, there was simply a, um, I think people in the excitement over social and the excitement over the fact that, you know, everybody is on Facebook and everybody is on Twitter, forgot that everybody doesn't pay for those things. Businesses, though, pay for things. And, and when businesses have a use for something, businesses pay. And LinkedIn is something that businesses, particularly when it comes to hiring and recruiting, have a real use for. And I think the, that just kind of got overlooked and forgotten for a while because it's not terribly sexy. You know, B2B, so to speak, people forgot was a, is a good business model, or can be at least, and it kind of just got overlooked, I think, and, and LinkedIn got kind of lumped in with some of these other companies because it had some of the features that were the same kind of on the top, but the actual business model was much different. So now, um, <clears throat> you know, now five or six months after the Facebook IPO, and you, you mentioned like there, there seems to be sort of a shift, right, to people looking at infra market looking at infrastructure companies, B2B companies, yep. enterprise IT companies. Um, how do you think venture capital, and let's say specifically Sandhill Venture Capital, right, is responding to the changes around them? Like that's one response, right? Yeah, well, I mean that's the big one, right? They're they're and they're jumping on it full board. It's why you see these, you know, every time you see the next uh, billion dollar valuation venture round, usually it's for an enterprise or an infrastructure sort of play. For the most part, that's that's where we've seen. There's some exceptions, you know, Airbnb right now is an exception, um, but for the most, I, you know, they're adjusting to it by jumping on it. And you know what in Two years and something's gone terrible, you know, enterprise IT spending has somehow gone down even further than it's gone down lately, then they'll go to something else. You know, a couple of years ago it was clean tech, then it was consumer, and now it's this, and it'll be something else in 12 months. And Do you see any similarities between the, like, let's say, say when people were looking at clean tech or clean yeah. energy to, like, how they kind of move around? Is this sort of a systematic thing? I think so. That venture capital, I mean, I guess it's trained to do that, right? It's trained to do that. It shouldn't be. I mean, in the sense of venture capital is supposed to be long-term money and, and not long-term like, you know, Fidelity or T. Rowe Price, you know, buying IBM stock, but long-term in the sense of from day one till the company goes public or till the VCs can get out, it can very well be, you know, four years to eight years. But there, folks like to buy into what's hot today. And, and you know, on the, clean, the only difference on the clean tech side the, or let me rephrase, I think the clean tech and the enterprise might be a little more similar in the sense of the clean tech had huge capital requirements, um, particularly some of the big uh, sure. kind of project finance things they did. The enterprise infrastructure stuff has larger capital requirements than, than social or consumer did in sure. general. And let, let's talk a little bit about the long-term aspect, right? I think a lot of, in, of, a lot of the larger funds um, like to say or like to believe or actually are long-term investors, right? And yeah. recently that can be seen as it can be dangerous, right? It can be too long. It can be. I mean, the, the big example from this past few weeks is A123, the, uh, the big battery company, which is actually based in my hometown outside of Boston. And um, 
A123 is a situation where the company raised money first, I think in 2002, if, if I'm correct about that, went public in 2009. And, and the day it went public, it had a pop. It was worth 2.2 or $2.4 billion on its first day. Its original investor was Northbridge Venture Partners, very old, very you know, respected, venerable firm. Uh, put in kind of between 45, 55 million bucks total. Uh, kept investing actually round after round, even leading later stage venture rounds. Uh, Northbridge never took out a dime, uh, never sold a single share until about two months before A123 went bankrupt. And then they were selling them for about 25, 28 cents on the dollar. Will return less than $10 million on that entire investment. They didn't sell. Sequoia, on the other hand, which was a later investor in A123, got out, if not completely, got most of its shares out long before that. So yeah, they held on. They held on way too long. And if I'm an investor in Northbridge, I'm angry about it, very angry about it. So how is it in, in these different cases? I mean, not to single out one firm, but in these cases. We can. Northbridge, they should have sold. Sure. I mean, I guess hindsight's twenty twenty two, right? Like in the sense of, um, you know, how is it that a, that a firm like that, that's been around for a really long time, and, and I'm sure this has happened in other cases we're, yeah. not, we're not talking about, but lose sight of their, their customer as the limited partner, right? I mean, it's, yeah. it's not sexy to admit that sometimes, but that is no, the reality. No, and a lot of VCs argue that their customer is really the entrepreneur and the limited partners are, I don't know, even know how they work in that analogy. I think the limited partners are the customers of the venture firms. Um, and the I, entrepreneurs are more like partners, right? Yeah, the, to be honest, the entrepreneurs are the product. I mean, you know, the LPs are the ones who are paying, so they're the, they're the customer. The, the entrepreneurs are the product um, to a certain extent. That doesn't mean you can't love your product and work very hard to make your product better, but ultimately they're the product. Um, I don't know how they lose sight. I mean, look, you're right. It is hindsight's 2020. Northbridge, same firm, for example, held on to Starrant Networks for a long time and made mm -hmm. a huge amount of money. And, and candidly, I'll be the first to admit that the day that Google went public, I suggested that Sequoia and Kleiner sort of should have sold shares in the IPO because yeah. I wasn't so sure it would go so much higher that they shouldn't at least get you know, their money back. But you know, you look at some firms who seem to have done it very smartly. You know, um, you know what Excel's done with Facebook, for example, where right. they where they returned their money a couple times over before the IPO and then have sold shares since then. Um, I think LPs are happy with how that's been managed. And so let's talk about that Excel tranche a little bit because I I remember watching that going on and they seemed to sort of shave off pieces and they had the liquidity in secondary markets yep. right to do they that did. right so i mean what separates those types of investors from doing it? i mean that really seems like they're they're managing their money and portfolio in a way and and they're able to unload shares right at a price and return right. principle um are, do you see more of that happen going to happen now I and mean, we've seen it over the last you know, three years with that, those sorts of companies. I mean, you saw, you know, New Enterprise Associates, which was the first money into Groupon, made its money, made its entire Groupon investment back before the IPO. Uh, Foundry and Union Square did the same thing uh, with Zynga. Um, Union Square's done the same thing with Twitter as a spark. Um, so you've seen it, but you're right. Those were situations where you had huge amounts of liquidity in the private market, Facebook as well. So you had the ability to do that. Um, you know, you go back to Northbridge with A123. That, mark, that private market didn't really exist back in 2008, not to the same extent. So it's really more of a situational sort of thing. I think, though, if you can get your money back before the IPO, so, so that your limited partners at least are break even on it, and then everything else is gravy, it's probably a smart thing to do. Uh, Grotech Ventures, which is a firm in DC, they did that with Living Social a couple years ago. I would think, given what Living Social situation is today, that was a very smart move for them. They've still got a big piece, but their LPs are already made whole on the original investment. Uh, what, what's your view, just shifting gears a bit, um, you know, let's say 30,000 30, foot view on secondary markets, right? Yeah. Um, do you think they're good for entrepreneurs, for uh, venture investors? Do you think that most of the value um, in the growth value in the, in the premiums gets gobbled up in the private? Do you think... Do you think they're bad for public markets? Like, how do you view secondary markets? I think they're good. Look, I think they're good for venture capitals. I think they're good for entrepreneurs. I think I think the more flexibility that you have in terms of capital structures, et cetera, is to, is generally beneficial. Uh, so, in general, I think they're good. I'll, I'll right. say a few things though. I don't think it's terribly healthy to have founders be able to get huge paydays before the venture capitalists are able to get paid back. Um, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer. I understand the idea that, that a founder has bootstrapped the company and has struggled. And I, I believe in being able to, if, if, the, if the money's there, the idea that, you know, they shouldn't have to be struggling to make car payments or make the mortgage and put that money back. On the other hand, Pink is taking $100 million out of Zynga ahead of time. That's a hell of a mortgage or that's a hell of a car. Uh, that, at that point, even though obviously he's still at the company and trying to make it work, y the incentives get a little bit skewed in those situations. So I, I think they're good. I think venture capitalists should be very careful, though, about how the entrepreneurs use them. Um, but in general, 
I, I think they're good. I, I do. The, as for the premium you, to the public markets, do you think they can distort valuation? They can, but no more so than a Series D or a Series E or a Series F private round can. I, I guess um, I, I don't think they've been proven to to be any more wrong than those investors have been. Okay, and so final final piece of this, which I think would be interesting, since you talk to a lot of people, and a lot of people you know email you or ask you for your insights. What do you think are like the two or three things that are on? you know, the larger fund in investors' minds right now? Like as they're looking out over the next, you know, let's say five to ten years or five to eight years. I mean, one is, are we going to be able to raise the next fund? Uh, and, and I don't mean okay. just because we, for some folks who have bad performance, but in general, the amount of capital that's being devoted to venture capital firms by the traditional limited partner base, the endowments, the foundations, the, the public pensions, is shrinking. So as a total asset class, it's shrinking? I think as a total access class, yeah, asset class, it's shrinking, and, and it's also really... Um, narrowing in terms of the number of managers, and, and not only because limited partners are saying, you know what, we only want to be in the top tier funds, it's because some of those top tier funds are raising all sorts of other funds. So, so take a Sequoia or a Kleiner or these firms that used to have base funds, which were early stage venture funds, but now have growth funds or India funds or China funds or whatever it is that are usually much larger. Well, if, or Excel is a good example of this too, they've done this. Well, if you want to get into the early stage fund, even though it's not an official staple and it's not official, wink, wink, you've also got to do the growth fund and you've also got to do the China fund or the India fund. So even if you've got the same amount of money allocated to venture capital, suddenly it's being taken up by a smaller number of managers. And, and therefore, if you're not one of those very small number of select managers, it's harder to get the cash. And then so for the, for the firms that are lucky enough to, to raise a lot of the, L, yeah. get a lot of investment and they raise more, I mean, the premium is going to be higher, right? To, to bring those returns back because there may it not is. be enough it returns is. in the market. It is. And look, the numbers, some of the big firms will argue that you know they've performed fine, but traditionally smaller, on the venture side, traditionally smaller funds have outperformed larger funds. You know, This is the argument Benchmark keeps making for why they have been raising $250 million funds. It's the argument First Round makes for why they're keeping their fund sizes small, even though they could be oversubscribed over and over again. Mm. Um, yeah, I think for the big funds, they have to be able to it's a different sort of game for them. But yeah, they have a hard time making the same sort of returns as, as the smaller guys do, no uh, doubt. And then, so one was out sort of raising the next one. What else are you hearing? Uh, I, I think there's, there's a general concern still over how we're going to how we're going to make the big hits and how we're going to sell these things um, and particularly to the public markets you know this has been considered a very good year for venture backed IPOs but it's a really low bar <laughs> that that they're setting mm -hmm. you know a couple of years ago there was zero so i guess anything better than zero is better than zero but I, I think there is concern over how many big grand slams can we really hit right now in the public markets. Um, and grand slams are what you ultimately need. I'd say the other thing that's a huge concern is for any firm that did life sciences or clean tech investing, put a huge amount of money in. And on the life sciences side, more pharma than anything else because those were big checks, how you're going to get out of those. I, you've got giant craters in both of those industries right now and not a huge amount of money going in, new money going in. Got it. Well, Dan, thanks for coming in. and I appreciate it. Look forward to the event tonight. Thanks. thanks man.